Okay, devotees, let us begin day 73 of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4. And uh, we're in chapter 27, which is titled Attack by Chandavega on the city of King Paranjan. And then a second point, the character of um, Kanya Kumari. Ka oh, sorry, character of Kala Kanya. I couldn't see it there. Okay, the character of, of Kala Kanya. Right, and <clears throat> let us begin with our prayers. Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nir Vishesha Shunyavadi Pastya Chadeja Tarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivas Adi Gora Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. Vanchikaba Turibyas Chakripa Sindhu Bya Eva Cha. Paditanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavebyo Namo Namaha. Okay. So we're in the second section, which is titled, just let me see. Narada tells Prachna Barishat how Puranjan's family increased. That's from verse 6 to 11, and we completed nine verses. So here we are with verse 10. Pranjan had 1,100 sons and 110 daughters, got them married, and then grandchildren were coming. So, okay, so verse 10. These sons and grandsons were virtually plunderers of King Pranjan's riches, including his home, treasury, servants, secretaries, and all other paraphernalia. Paranjan's attachment for these things was very deep-rooted. Right, so in this verse, Prabhupada says, the word Riktahareshu is um, significant. It means plunderers of wealth. So one's, one's children and other descendants, ultimately, they plunder one's accumulated wealth. And there, there are many celebrated business people, industrialists. They produce great wealth, but then all their money was plundered by their children and grandchildren. And yeah, so in India, Prabhupada, uh, whew, Prabhupada, uh, I had not heard of this before, but Prabhupada says that he, we have actually seen one industrialist who, like King Paranjan, was very much sexually inclined and had half a dozen, had six wives. Each wife had a separate house, etc., which cost a lot. So when Prabhupada was talking with the man, he saw the man was busy trying to get money so all his sons and daughters could get half a million rupees each. So, because so, in those days, half a million rupees was really a lot. Now it's a fair amount, but it's not that much. So such men are called mudhas, fools in scripture. They work hard, get money. Then they're happy to see it being plundered by their sons and grandsons. And they don't want to return the wealth to its original owner, who is Krishna. Bhaktaram Yagyatapa Sam Saravaloka Maheshvaram. Yes, he's the actual enjoyer. So those people who are so-called earners of money, Prabhupada says they're simply people who know tricks by which they can take away God's money under the guise of business and industry. And then after accumulating money, they enjoy seeing it being plundered by their sons and grandsons. This is the materialistic way of life and 
in this way they get entangled and they can't extricate themselves. So Bhagavad Gita chapter 16 verses 13 to 15 describes this. I won't read the whole um, translation, but it's the famous series of verses in which the demon in chapter 16, Bhagavad Gita, the demon is thinking, I've got so much money, I'll get more. Uh, yeah, I'll increase it in the future. I had an enemy, I killed him. There's another enemy, I'll kill him too. I'm the Lord of everything. I'm the enjoyer. Perfect, powerful and happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very, I'm wonderful. And I'll do sacrifices, give some charity and rejoice. Prabhupada says in this way, or the verse says, in this way such persons are deluded by ignorance. So in the second paragraph, Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, in this way, in this way people engage in various laborious activities and their attachment for body, home, family, nation and community becomes more and more deep rooted. And we go on to verse 11. The great sage Narada continued, My dear King Prachana Bharishat, like you, King Paranjan also became implicated in so many desires. Like you, of course, he's saying, because Paranjan is simply based on Prachana Bharishat. So he also became implicated in so many desires. Thus he worshipped demigods, forefathers, social leaders with various sacrifices which were all very ghastly because they were inspired by the desire to kill animals. And so Prabhupada comments that he's explaining Paranjan's character in order to teach Prachana Bharishat. It's all a it's all about how Prachina Bharishat is living. So if Narada just told him, listen, stop what you're doing, then Prachina Bharishat wouldn't have listened. But because he does it in this colorful, interesting way, he's got Prachina Bharishat's attention. So generally the Kami, Kamis do sacrifices, worship demigods, to take care of the future. Scientists are concerned about the future, so they try to create things to make energy, etc. Now we see they're running out of petrol. Bhagavad Gita 241 illustrates this famous verse, of course, Vyavasayat Makabut here. Ekeha Kurunandana Bahushaka Hyanantas Chabudayo Vevisayanam. Those who are on the spiritual path are resolute in purpose and their aim is one. O beloved child of the Kurus, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branched. So this is another one of these lengthy purports. Um, second paragraph. Those people who are really, they're in knowledge they are determined to execute Krishna consciousness, but others like the different types mentioned, rascals, mudhas, sinners, dus duskritinas, lowest of mankind, naradamas, those bereft of intelligence, maya paritagyana, those who take shelter of demonic way of life, asuram bhavam asrita, they're not interested in Krishna consciousness. So they get into so many other things, mainly centered around killing animals. And many of them, they say, you must eat meat, otherwise you won't get enough vitamins. But then to digest the meat, you must drink liquor. And to keep a balance, you have to have enough sex. So then you can work. So then you have to work like an ass in order to maintain your family. Third paragraph, 
Prabhupada points out there are two ways of killing animals. One is through sacrificing them, so some religious type of process. And the other is just slaughterhouses. So all, all the religions we find, except Buddhism, they have a program for killing animals in, ter in their worship system. Yeah. In the Vedic system, the animal, the animal eaters, they're recommended to sacrifice a goat in the temple of Kali. Then they can eat the flesh. Then, then they can drink wine by offering it to the goddess Chandika. So in other words, the process, th these religious processes are there to restrict, to restrict. But nowadays people, they've given up the district restrictions and they just have slaughterhouses and then distilleries. So Narada Muni knows that religious animal killing takes you back into birth and death. You forget about going back to Godhead. Fourth paragraph. Prabhupada explains how Narada Muni chastised Vyas for presenting Karamakandi, a fruit of religious activity, in a colorful way. And this is, he, Prabhupada quotes Bhagavatam 1.5.15. This is the translation. The people in general are naturally inclined to enjoy and you have encouraged them in that way in the name of religion. This is verily condemned and is quite unreasonable, unreasonable because they're guided under your, under your instructions. They'll accept such activities in the name of religion and will hardly care for prohibitions. So in this way, he's saying, Narada told Vyasa, you have done a great disservice for the for humanity. And, and this line of thought continues in the next paragraph five. Um, Narada Prabhupada mentions how Narada Muni chastised Vyas for compiling so many literatures, supplementary and whatever, which don't d mention, excuse me, don't mention direct devotional service. But under Narada's instruction, Bhagavatam talks about devotional service. So the conclusion is that neither the Lord nor a devotee really sanctions animal killing in the name of religion. Indeed, and Prabhupada makes the point that Krishna incarnated as Buddha for this specific purpose. Because to really like strongly sanction animal killing. But otherwise, as Prabhupada says here, neither the Lord nor the devotees ever sanctions animal killing in the name of religion. Animal sacrifice um, in the name of religion is under tamagun. Yes. And Prabhupada quotes uh, Bhagavad Gita chapter 18, verses 31 and 32. You can read through those yourself. Sixth paragraph. Those who are in ignorance manufacture some religious system for killing animals. But actually, dharma is transcendental. Therefore, Krishna says in 1866, you should give up everything and surrender to him. And so like this, the Lord and the devotees are actually teaching transcendental dharma, which doesn't allow animal killing. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, at the present moment, it's the greatest misfortune that in India, Many so-called missionary workers 
are spreading irreligion in the name of religion. They claim an ordinary human being to be God and recommend meat eating for everyone, including the so-called sannyasis, <laughs> Hare Krishna. So the third section, we go on to the third section and it's just, it's just verse 12, which explains that Puranjan approaches, is approaching the time of death. Right, so here's verse 12. Thus, King Puranjan being attached to fruit of activities, Karmakandya, as well as kith and kin, means family members, and being obsessed with polluted consciousness, eventually arrived at that point not very much liked by those who are overly attached to material things, which is a sort of a nice way of saying the time of death. So yeah, Prabhupada comments that death, of course, is very unwelcome for those who are materially attached. Prabhupada mentions this, the famous instructive story, which he told once on the disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, I think in Los Angeles, that a saintly person blessed four types of people in different ways in, regarding, in, in regards to living and dying, living and or dying. So he blessed, he blessed the saintly person, blessed the prince, live forever. The saintly person, saintly devotee, live or die as you like. The brahmachari, die now. And the hunter, don't live, don't die. And Prabhupada explains here in this first paragraph why these people were instructed, blessed like that. Thing is, the prince, he's got lots of money to enjoy his senses. So he's accumulating, oh, so much bad karma through sense gratification. So better he, he live and not die because when he dies, he's going to just suffer terribly. Sinful reactions for his sinful activities. The, the brahmachari, the brahmachari is advised that just die now because he's li living a very austere life focused in Krishna consciousness for going back to Godhead. Better to die now and go back to Godhead so he doesn't have to do more um, austerity. And plus, well, Prabhupada elsewhere in regards to the same story, Prabhupada also mentions that now the brahmachari is so focused in Krishna consciousness. If he dies now, he'll just go back to Godhead. But, but if he lives on to become a householder and he gets absorbed in the householder way of life, having to make money, look after the family, etc., he may forget Krishna. So better die now while you're remembering Krishna in a very concentrated way. Then the saintly person, great devotee, he, he's with Krishna always. Now, while he's living, he's always hearing and chanting about Krishna. That's all he does. So, so it doesn't matter. If he carries on living, he's with, with Krishna. If he dies or whenever he dies, he's going to go to Krishna. It's all the same. But the, the hunter, oh, he's living by killing innocent animals. Elsewhere, Prabhupada talks about the butcher. Yeah, same, same idea. Horrible life. Oh, he, he shouldn't live. It's just too horrible. See the blood-stained scene, Prabhupada says elsewhere. So better not to live like that. It's too horrible. But he sh if he dies, better not to die because he'll just go to hell. Oh, Krishna. 
So better don't live, don't die for the hunter or the butcher. And second paragraph, Paranjan's now old and he's losing his strength to enjoy. Of course, he feels miserable. And such people, they want to live on by scientific advancement, but they can't. Yeah, Get Prabhupada talks about some person he knew or encountered that asked, uh, he, he had a heart attack, attack, and he asked the doctor, give me another four years. Doctor couldn't do it, the man died. So they, by scientific methods, they would like to become immortal. But anyway, you know, it's just a waste of time. So, yeah, under the leadership of such crazy fellows, who are looking for immortal life on the material level, the civilization's going on under the leadership of such fools. What can you expect from the civilization? So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, cruel death, however, comes and takes all of them away despite their desire to live forever. This type of mentality was exhibited by Hirani Kashipu. But when the time was right, the Lord personally killed him within a second. And I remember hearing a class of Prabhupada's, a recording of a class of Prabhupada's. He talks of Mahatma Gandhi, who was so famous and revered and worshipped. Um, but Prabhupada said, when, when his time came, death came and just threw him away. Just threw him away. Nothing special that, oh, he's candy, big man. So on we go to the next section, which is number four, and it's called Chanda Vega Attacks the City of Paranjan. It's verses 13 to 18. So we'll read the verses first. 13. O king, in Gandava Loka, there's a king named Chandavega. Under him, there are 360 very powerful Gandava soldiers. Okay, just, just guess who those soldiers are. Anyway, we'll come back in a few minutes. And that'll all be clarified. Verse 14. Along with Chandavega were as many female Gandharvis as they were soldiers, and all of them repetitively plundered all the paraphernalia for sense enjoyment. 15. When King Gandharva Raj, Chandavega, and his followers began to plunder the city of Paranjan, a snake with five hoods began to defend the city. Verse 16. The five hooded serpent the superintendent and protector of the city of King Paranjan, fought with the Gandavas for 100 years. He fought alone with all of them, although they numbered 720, 360 men and 360 women, 720 soldiers of Chandavega. 17. Because he had to fight alone with so many soldiers, all of whom were great warriors, the serpent with five hoods became very weak. Seeing that his most intimate friend was weakening, King Paranjan and his friends and citizens living within the city all became very anxious. 18. King Paranjan collected taxes in the city known as Panchala, and thus was able to engage in sexual indulgence. Being completely under the control of women, he could not understand that his life was pa passing away and that he was reaching the point of death. Right, so let's go back and go through the verses with the purports. Verse 13. O king, in Gandhava Loka, there is a king named Chandavega, 
Under him, there are 360 very powerful Gandava soldiers. So, uh, Prabhupada's purport is there, time is figuratively described as Chandavega. Chandavega, Prabhupada explains, means very swiftly passing away. So in the year, there's 360 days or so, and Chandavega's soldiers represent these days. So time goes quickly. The soldiers are quickly carrying away the days of our lives. The sun's rising and setting, snatching away the balance of our lives, can't be stopped. But for the devotee, time doesn't Time doesn't take away the devotee's time. So Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, chapter 3, verse, 30, verse 17, says, Ayor harati vai pumsam udyan ashtam chayan asau. Let's just quickly have a look. This is the famous verse. I just mentioned it. What? Was it yesterday? Both by rising and by setting, the sun decreases the duration of life of everyone, except one who utilizes the time by discussing topics of the all good personality of Godhead. Means, of course, the devotees. Then the second paragraph, Prabhupada explains that mirages and other illusory things are sometimes called Gandavas. Well, well, let me just say that our, Prabhupada says, our losing our lifespan, day by day we lose a day, we lose a day, we lose a day, we lose a year. Our losing our lifespan is taken as advancement of age. But Prabhupada says, this imperceptible passing away of the days of life is figuratively referred to here as Gandharvas. And there's all this figurative expression in regards to this whole story of Paranjan, as we've seen. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, as explained in later, later verses, such Gandharvas are both male and female. This indicates that both men and women lose their lifespan imperceptibly by the force of time, which is here and described as Chandavega is time. Yes, okay, so on to verse 14. Along with Chandavega were as many Gandharvis as there were soldiers. And all of them repetitively plundered all the paraphernalia for sense enjoyment. So that's 360. 360 big powerful male soldiers and 360 female Gandavis um, who were also engaged in plundering the paraphernalia for sense enjoyment. So the Gandharvis are the uh, are knight, the Gandharvis. They're an engaged, plundering sense, sense enjoyment. Yes, so that, that's the Gandharvis. They're, they're the knights, which, which are for sense gratification. So scientific advancement is to make things uh, for sense enjoyment, sense gratification. So much manufacturing is going on, making machines for household life, Prabhupada says, washing dishes, cleaning floors for shaving, <laughs> and these things are for sense gratification. And they're described in this verse as sarva karma. Venir mitam, which means, let me just check the literal meaning there. 
sarvakama, all kind manufacturing all kinds of desirable objects. But Prabhupada makes the point the time factor is so strong. But not only is life going, but the machines are deteriorating also. Therefore, in this verse, the word vilumpanti, plundering, is used. Everything's being plundered from the very beginning of our lives. So, it, so in the second purport, Prabhupada makes the point that this plundering, it begins with the day of our birth. And eventually the day will come for death. Then we'll get another body. At least if you're not a devotee, you'll get another body for continuing the program of sense gratification. Prahlad Maharaj Prabhupada points out, very important point, Prahlad describes this process as Puna Punas Charvata Charvananam, Bhagavatam 7530. A materialistic life means chewing the chewed again and again, puna punas, again and again, charavata charavanam, chewing, chewing, again and again. So, of course, the central point of material life is sense gratification, but it's all chewing the chewed. And Prabhupada makes the point, whether we squeeze sugar out of sugar cane with our teeth, you know, by chewing it, or with a machine, the result is the same, sugar cane juice. We may discover many ways to squeeze the juice out of the sugar cane, but the result's the same. Verse 15, when king Gandharva Raj, the king of the Gandharvas, who's Chandavega time, and his followers began to plunder the city of P Paranjan. A snake with five hoods began to defend the city. Yes. So they're plundering the city of Paranjan. What does that mean? They're destroying the body. That's the because the bot the city means his body. Yeah. So then as they and that the idea is they're just bringing the body to the point of death. You know, not necessarily the entire way of that entire lifetime, but now death is coming. Prabhupada makes the point that the five hoods of the snake, five hooded snake, uh, it's, that indicates that the life air is surrounded by five kinds of air, known as prana, apana, viana, udana, and samana. And when the body is inactive, the prana or the life air is active. So up to the age of, what does Prabhupada say, 50, you can actively work for sense gratification. But after 50, your energy decreases. So you may, you know, you may push on till 55, but, but generally governments say 55 is time to retire. Yeah, so that that energy. Anyway, Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, thus the 55th year is generally taken by government regulations as the final year for retirement. The energy which is fatigued after 50 years is figuratively described here as a serpent with five hoods those five different life years. Okay, verse 16. Verse 16. The five-hooded serpent, the superintendent and protector of the city of King Paranjan, fought with the Gandavas for a hundred years. 
He fought alone with all of them, although they numbered 720. Right, so the five-hooded serpent, as we just read, means the life ears, the main life ear, with the subsidiary five life ears, that was the snake, uh, who's protecting the city of Paranjan, the city is his body. So that serpent, the life heir, fought with the Gandavas, 720, 360 days, 360 nights, 720. So he, he fought with them. He fought with time, in other words. But what can you do? He fought alone. Yes. So, so the body, of course, is destroyed. And you can f fight. He fought and fought. The snake fought and fought. But eventually, there's 720 opposition. They got the better of him. And so he came to the point of death. But Prabhupada makes, of course, important transcendental point that despite the struggle to keep the body alive, the soul, the actual person, does not die. Bhagavad Gita 2.20, famous 2.20, um, says, Najayati mriyate vakadachin nayam bhutva buya for the soul there's never birth nor death, nor having once been does he ever cease to be. He's unborn, eternal, ever existing, undying and primeval. He's not slain when the body is slain. So the living entity doesn't take birth or die. Um, as Paranjan, as the person that the material body does. So the living entity doesn't take birth or die, but in, in bodily existence, he has to fight with the stringent laws of material nature through the life, through the lifetime. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, he must face different kinds of miserable conditions. Despite all this, the living entity, due to illusion, thinks that he's well situated in sense gratification. Verse 17. Because he had to fight alone with so many soldiers, all of whom were great warriors, the serpent with five hoods became very weak. Seeing that his most intimate friend was weakening, King Paranjan and his friends and citizens living within the, citizens, the city all became very anxious. Yeah, the body and the senses and so on became anxious that our protector is, is going down. What are we going to do? So Prabhupada explains the living entity lives in the body struggles for existence with the limbs, the senses, etc., who are referred to here as citizens and friends. But uh, you, the thing is, you can, you can struggle alone against many soldiers for some time, but not forever. So up to a hundred years, you can have up to a hundred years in these bodies with good good luck but after that you know you just you go down you're finished so Prabhupada points out Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song um Vridakala Aula Sabasuka Bhagala when one becomes old it becomes impossible to enjoy material happiness. Generally people think in old age you become religious, you become meditative, you take to yoga to relax, but that meditation they talk about is just a farce for those who've lived for sense, sense gratification. If you want to meditate you have to be self-controlled, 
restrained from sense gratification. But now it's just a fashion for everyone. Fashion, I mean, meditation has become a fashion for people overly addicted to sense, sense gratification. And therefore that medita meditation is defeated by the struggle for existence. Although sometimes such so-called meditation may pass, it may be called transcendental meditation, but it's not really. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, King Puranjan, the living entity, being thus victimized by the hard struggle for existence, took to transcendental meditation with his friends and relatives, thinking maybe this will carry us through. Verse 18, King Puranjan collected taxes in the city known as Panchala and thus was able to engage in sexual indulgence. Being completely under the control of women, he could not understand that his life was passing away and that he was reaching the point of death. Yes, so the government people, they, they are in a position, they have access to tax money and they use it for their sense gratification. This is what's happening in Kali Yuga. Yeah. They exalt the big ministers, secretaries, presidents, collect taxes for sense gratification. So you get a top heavy government, too many people, and you can't, you can't maintain it. You have to just tax more and more. And it's just a nonsense. These people forget, these government people and everybody else, forget that death is coming to take their sense gratification. And of course, many of them think that after death there's nothing, it's just, so you might as well make the most of it. This is Charvaka's theory. Charvaka is famous atheist in India. That he, He's saying, you know, you're only going to live for the one life, this one lifetime, so you might as well make the most of it. Get, get money, get ghee by hook or crook. Yeah, like this. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, this is the philosophy of those who are too much materially addicted. Such philosophizing will not save one from the danger of death, nor will it save one for from an abominable afterlife. Ooh, Krishna. So we go on to the next section five from verse 19 to verse 22. And this is interesting. Narada encounters Kala Kanya, the daughter of time. You remember there's a sort of a double, a double, um, chapter title, The Attack of Chandavega, which we've been talking about, and then the activities of Kalakanya, who's the daughter of the time, because of time, because Kala means time and Kanya means daughter. As from verse 19 to verse 22, let's read the verses, verse 19, my dear King Prachinabarhi Shat, at this time, the daughter of formidable time was seeking her husband, looking for a husband throughout the three worlds. Although no one agreed to accept her, she came. Because, yeah, I mean, who wants to marry such a person? Verse 20, the daughter of time, Jara, was very unfortunate. Jara means old age. Consequently, so she was very unfortunate. Consequently, she was known as Durbaga, ill-fated Durbaga. However, she was once pleased with the great king and because the king accepted her, she granted him a great benediction. 
When I, means Narada Muni, once came to this earth from Brahmaloka, the highest planetary system, the daughter of time, wandering over the universe, met me. Knowing me to be an avowed brahmachari, she became lusty and proposed that I accept her. Narada Muni. She proposed to Narada Muni, please become my husband. 22, the great sage Narada continued, When I refused to accept her request, she became very angry at me and cursed me severely. Because I refused, refused her request, she said that I would not be able to stay in one place for a long time. Yes, okay. So back to the beginning of the section. Verse 19 to 22, Narada encounters Kalakanya, the daughter of time. 19. My dear King Prachana Barhishat, at this time the daughter of formidable time was seeking her husband throughout the three worlds. Although no one agreed to accept her, she came. Yes, she came. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, induce, uh, so when the body becomes old and is practically invalid, it's subject to jira, the sufferings of old age. Yeah. There are four basic kinds of suffering, birth, old age, disease, and death. Janma, murichyu, jara, Vyadi. Janma, birth, mrityu, death, jara, old age, vyadi, disease. Disease. No scientists have found the solution for these four, although they continue to try. So the invalidity of old age is called, is known as jara, who is figuratively explained here. Because, you know, there's so much use of figurativeness. Figuratively explained here as the daughter of time. Prabhupada concludes the purport by say, saying, No one likes her, but she's very much anxious to accept anyone as a husband. No one likes to become old and invalid, but this is inevitable for everyone. Yeah. So verse 20, the daughter of time, Jara, was very unfortunate. Consequently, she was known as Durbaga, ill-fated. However, she was once pleased with a great king. And because the king accepted her, she granted him a great benediction. So let's look at Prabhupada's purport. Bhaktivinoda Prabhupada um, repeats the mention of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song, a line from the song, Sabha Sukha Bhagala, Bhagala. All kinds of happiness disappear in old age. Sabha Sukha Bhagala. Sabha all Sukha happiness Bhagala disappears. All types of happiness disappear in old age. Therefore, no one likes old age or jara. So therefore, Jara, the daughter of time, old age, is known as a most unfortunate daughter. But she was once accepted by a great king. So who was that? Prabhupada explains that was Yayati. And Prabhupada, in the purport of verse 20, tells her story. Let's just briefly go through it. That Sukracharya's daughter was married to Yayati. And when she went to live with Yayati, her friend Sarmishta went with her. Uh, Yayati then became attached to Sarmishta. And Sukracharya's daughter complained to Sukracharya her father. So Shukracharya cursed Yayati 
to become prematurely old. So Yayati had five young sons. He begged them, please accept uh, my old, please give me your youth for this old age, which I've been cursed, you know, to prematurely have. Uh, but four of them were just, they didn't want to become prematurely old so their father could just enjoy their youth. But one of the sons, Puru, he agreed. He accepted Yayati's old age and Yayati gave him the kingdom. And Prabhupada mentions that um, two, two of the sons, Yayati's other sons, being disobedient to Yayati, they were given kingdoms outside of India, Prabhupada says, um, probably, most probably, Turkey and Greece. Yeah. So the purport is, you can accumulate wealth and opulence, but during old age you can't enjoy them. So although Puru, he got the kingdom, prematurely he got the kingdom, but he couldn't enjoy it because he had accepted prematurely old age. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, one should not wait for old age in order to become Krishna conscious. Due to the invalidity of old age, one cannot make progress in Krishna consciousness, however opulent one may be materially. Verse 21, Narada Muni speaking, when I once came to this earth from Brahmaloka, the highest planetary system, the daughter of time, Kalakanya, wandering over the universe, met me. Knowing me to be an avowed brahmachari, she became lusty and proposed that I accept her. So Narada Muni, of course, um, he's an avowed brahmachari, as, as he says here. Um, in the verse, it's, just, it's um, expressed as brihad vratam, he had taken a great vow, means he was an avowed brahmachari. So he was what we call generally a naishtika brahmachari never involved in sex life. So as a result, he was an evergreen youth because having sex life deteriorates the body. But if you have no sex life, you remain youthful. So Prabhupada says, old age could not attack him. So, so Kalakanya, the daughter of time, Thinking Narada is an ordinary man, she confronted him with her lusty desire. And it, it requires great strength to resist a woman's attraction. Prabhupada says it's particularly difficult for old men, what to speak of young. So brahmacharis, brahmacharis must follow in the footsteps of Narada Muni, who did not accept Jara's proposal. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, those who are too much sex sexually addicted become victims of jara, and very soon their lifespan is shortened because sex indulgence, it deteriorates the physical condition. Without utilizing the human form of life for Krishna consciousness, the victims of, of jara die very soon. In this, in this world. Verse 22. The great sage Narada continued, when I refused to accept her request, she became very angry at me and cursed me severely. Because I refused her request, she said that I would not be able to stay in one place for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, Prabhupada explains, Narada Muni has a spiritual body. 
So old age, disease, birth, death, these things don't affect him. And he's a very kind, a very kind devotee. All he does is travel and preach to help people become devotees. So generally, he has no need to, say, to stay in a place for more than the time it takes to do his preaching. So therefore, since he's already traveling all over the universe, Kalakanya's curse is described as being fortunate. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Like Narada Muni, many other devotees of the Lord are engaged in preaching the glories of the Lord in different places and in different universes. Such personalities are beyond the jurisdiction of material laws. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.